Okay, it's uh, it's truly an honor today to to have uh, my son Zachary uh, on the day before he heads back to Brown after his all too brief visit to the Seattle area uh, uh, to come here and tell us a bit about his summer internship, which was with the ACLU. Um, Zach is uh, going into his junior year at Brown, and he has a variety of interests uh, spanning computer science, anthropology, and and as you see, um, policy and technology and policy. So take it away, Zachary. Oh, thank you. Yeah, off to a great start here. Um, here. I get to be a father, which I really like. Okay, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Dad. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so I'm Zach, son of Eric. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a, a anthropology, attentive anthropology and computer science concentrator at Brown. Um, and I was really fortunate to get this awesome opportunity to do some work for um, the ACLU um, and a great opportunity to kind of like reconcile my interest in computer science and my interest in anthropology. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about kind of what the ACLU was doing um, and broken windows um, policing, kind of what that means, the semantics behind that, um, and also talk about, yeah, just like, yeah, general semantics um, and, uh, and sort of with stuff, some of the stuff that I worked on um, over the summer and that some of your colleagues have actually worked on. Um, okay. Oh, wait, how do I go to the next slide? Oh, do I have to press this button? Oh, there we go. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Thank you again. Um, anyway, so oh yeah, I was first going to give some background on the ACLU, talk about um, broken windows placing like, very generally, um, some of the history there, talk about the data that we have and some of the insights that have already been found in that data, um, and also talk about some of the ACLU data projects. Um, okay. So the ACLU. Um, I'm sure you guys are all fairly familiar. Um, they've definitely come to the fore lately with the current, um, the current dialogue in our country. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union is a nonpartisan um, organization, nonprofit, founded in 1920 to defend American civil liberties. Um, here's their, like, you know, their mission statement to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties guaranteed to every person in this country by the Constitution and laws of the United States. And I italicize the every person because that's sort of the, that's really where um, they've entered the kind of, uh, under dialogue in a very sort of contentious way. Um, but some sort of current, uh, current headlines they've been very uh, outspoken about, uh, Trump's executive order, um, banning immigration, or certain immigration from uh, certain states. Uh, Texas, uh, the transgender, um, anti-transgender um, bathroom bill. Uh, Trump joking when he like told police to you know r rough up suspects. Um, and of course, our president's regular tweet storms. Um, and it was really, really cool to be kind of situated in the ECLU when all these sort of headlines were breaking. Um, and you hear like the buzz and, you know, Carol Rose is there. She's the head of the chapter getting interviewed um, next to me. That was very, very cool. Um, and I got to talk to all these like civil rights advocates um, in real time about what was going on. It was really, really exciting. Um, so this is like the, these are the, the headers to the, uh, the ACLU's platform. And I'm mostly going to talk about criminal law reform today. Um, and what they're doing in that department. Um, but I'm going to touch on immigrants' rights, and uh, you'll see how that ties in later. Okay. Um, so one area within the criminal justice reform uh, that the ACU is very, very ardent about is um, sort of the front end of the system, the police, how the police engage with the public. Um, they see it as sort of the, the funnel into the criminal justice system, where um, over-incarceration uh, begins. It's really about the, there's really a focus at the ACLU about the police, what the police are doing, how they're engaging with certain populations, largely like marginalized groups. Um, so one thing, one big thing in this department that the, broken, that, um, that the ACLU is fighting against is 
broken windows theory and broken windows policing. Have you all like, heard about broken windows theory? <laughs> broken windows. <laughs> <laughs> I like the win instead of the if. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so broken windows theory. So in brief, um, it's a model of policing that was first described in 1982. And um, it focused on the importance of disorder, for example, like breaking windows or broken windows and like vandalism and generating and leading to like more felonious, more serious crime, like murder. Um, so the general understanding is that when you have a state of disorder in a community represented in some, in, represented by like vandalism, broken windows, maybe drug dealing or homelessness and panhandling, that sort of state of disorder and that sense of um, uh, uh, a scarcity of law enforcement leads to people taking, you know, more, um, committing more aggressive crimes, um, more dangerous crimes. So all these sort of more minor offenses from this perspective, in this lens, lead to like this. Um, and let's see. So yeah, broken windows policing um, is a big umbrella and contains a lot of different sort of policies by various different um, police organizations and, and, and theories. Um, but there are two really big parts to it. There's stop and frisking and low-level arrests. Um, stop and frisking being um, police encounters with, uh, with the public where um, the public can be stopped and searched for contraband. And low-level arrests being things like um, drug violations, trespassing, disorderly conduct, licensing um, that can emerge oftentimes from stop and frisks, like when you find contraband on an individual. Um, so stop and frisks. Um, are also called um, field interrogations and observations. And in stop and frisk data sets, usually they're broken three ways. Um, there are observations. Um, these are entries where the police are documenting an individual, usually from afar. They're not searching them. They're not engaging them. There are encounters. These are consensual encounters with civilians. Um, and then there are stops, which is kind of a stop and frisk in the more <clears throat> traditional sense, stopping someone for a traffic violation or, or for some suspicious activity and often frisking them, um, searching them for contraband. Okay. So the justifications for a stop and frisk um, are, are the following. And this is actually how they appear in, in stop and frisk data sets. Um, you'll see um, justification being an encounter where this is a consensual meetup and therefore there doesn't need to be a formal justification. Um, intelligence, a police officer could be like, Actually, wait, hang on. Oh, wait, whoops, yeah. Um, a police officer can have information about a certain like, possible suspect. Um, they could have like, um, a description circulating of an individual wearing a certain hoodie or um, in a certain type of car. Um, and that intelligence can be justification. Um, probable cause is when a police, a police officer sees direct like, or circumstantial evidence of a crime. So like the outline of a weapon in someone's pocket, like the glint of like, a gun, um, the exchange of... of, of some sort of illicit substance, um, those sorts of things fall into probable cause. Um, reasonable suspicion is where police have the most discretion. Reasonable suspicion uh, is when an officer makes a call based on his expertise. Um, so this can be, yeah. Are these actual legal, legal distinctions? These are legal distinctions and how they appear in data, in, in, in our data set. Um, yeah, so reasonable suspicion could be, well, he was walking very suspiciously and I walked after him and he started to run away. That can be reasonable suspicion. But it can also be, uh, and this was uh, a, a vignette that my, one of my uh, people working, one of my colleagues, um, Carl Williams, um, mentioned to me, but it can be an officer, and this actually happened, testifying on the stand that he stopped someone and they ended up finding contraband, but they stopped this individual because he wouldn't make eye contact with me when he was like driving by. So it's very, they have a lot of discretion when handling these cases. And it really emerges in reasonable suspicion. Um, and so, oh yes, of course, the, um, there's been some sort of, it's a very contentious issue, stop and frisk. Um, there was a legal uh, decision in 2013 by a federal judge condemning the New York uh, stop and frisk program, which is considered the canonical example of stop and frisk. Um, and yes, except... It still, it still goes on in like cities of all sizes. I was looking particularly at Boston's data. 
um, which has like, just been released. Heard quoted, oh, stop and frisk has reduced crime. So other people say, no, it yeah. hasn't. Is that some stuff you want to talk about? Or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's there, in some sense, the jury is sort of out on stop and frisk. Um, at first, um, a lot of individuals believe that stop and frisk overall had an impact reducing crime. But overall, those have sort of been statistically overruled. Um, and there are other sort of factors as well besides just raw crime values that have to be considered. The illegality of it. Which yeah, is, exactly. There's a sort of, there's the, the underlying ideology is, 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 I would argue, very harmful. But so has anyone heard of William Bratton? So William Bratton was the, uh, the first he was the head of the New York Transit Police. Um, and he became uh, the New York City Police Commissioner. Uh, and he sort of set the precedent for stop and frisk in New York City. Um, he, uh, this is under, of course, I believe Rudy Giuliani. Um, and um, Initially, it was met with praise. Right? It was, people said, oh, this, we're cleaning up the streets. Um, but there was a lot, of, a lot of public backlash when it became clear from a lot of the data, which, was, which started to be meticulously documented, that these stops were drastically, um, uh, minorities were drastically um, overrepresented in these stops. So you said he kind of started this yeah. thing in New York. Is it because the rules changed and somehow it became more subjective to define what... Mm -hmm. Uh, so there wasn't really, yeah. For like suspicion is so subjective. I can kind of write a suspicion story for anybody. I stop. Yeah, okay. yeah. So was, it, was it always that open ended, and he kind of defined I, it in the part? I believe it was always op like open ended, and now we're starting to see like legal rulings on this issue. Um, but yeah, he really took it. Uh, he really formalized it and made it actual police policy, like very, very, like very, like uh, translucently, transparently. Um, cool. So the question, yeah, did, did it work? And yet, right, maybe it did. Like there was like uh, one study that found like there was a moderate decrease in in felonies um, in, in areas where stop and frisks were were employed. Um, but the kind of current verdict on the actual the statistical significance is not really. It actually, like, the latest report, this was like from I think a month or two ago, was that it, it, it does no real significant increase. And in fact, there might even be a decrease. Um, or there is a, there is a decrease, um, not an increase. Yeah. Um, so yeah, problems. So there's like mixed statistical evidence um, right now. Like generally, the consensus is that it doesn't really do much. Um, but there's also this really um, huge problem, probably even more significant, and that's you know human cost. Um, so there's evidence that stop and frisk in a community reduces the legitimacy of the police rather than sort of strengthening their foothold, um, causes a rift between the community and police officers. Um, there's very, very crisp evidence of institutional discrimination almost everywhere where we're seeing stop and frisks. Um, and also, there's this idea of a vicious cycle um, with stop and frisk. Um, and the idea behind it is, you know, if you're stopping and frisking, um, if that's targeting certain high crime areas, um, oftentimes, these are areas inhabited like largely by minorities. These are more poor areas. Um, then this does two things: right, you're disrupting the communities, or like you're, this leads to arrests or break families apart, um, and you're also increasing recorded uh, crime in those regions. Um, and then you have this sort of creates high crime areas, and then those high crime areas are then the target of stop and frisks. Um, so this vicious cycle is understood to be like, taking place and having very, very um, uh, uh, negative effects in lots of different communities where stop and frisk is employed. Um, and then here's more on the human cost. Um, there's evidence that um, almost as part of this like, cycle, um, lots of individuals, particularly black individuals in these communities, um, they don't just get stopped once. This isn't like a one-time thing. They can get stopped one, two, three, or four, or five times. Um, and do you guys remember the Castile shooting? Um, that, was, that was the, the Facebook Live scre uh, streamed uh, shooting. Um, I believe that um, a recent report um, stated that he was actually stopped by police before that like 20 times. Um, so there's this human cost here. Um, so time for some of the data analysis. So this is actually done by a couple of your former, I mean, colleagues and also like former in-house people, Sherrod, Goel, um, Justin, I think Rao went to recently. 
Uh, in MSR in New York City, personally not Stanford, MSNE. Yeah. And Justin Rao just went off to a to a company, right? To uh, Home Away. Which one? Home Away. Home Away. He's he's, a, he's an economist. Yeah. Ah. Yes. Well, former colleagues, um, I guess, still in the field, um, they did a very, very, very extensive work data analysis on the New York City, you know, the classic stop and frisk data, uh, and. One novel part of their, of their work is they train a classifier on the data. And they just wanted to see what does this classifier pick up, what features does it pick up um, when we train it on the information that the police officers have at the scene of a stop and frisk. Um, and they found that they could actually, um, if they um, relied on the certainty of their classifier, they could go down to the top 10 most certain uh, cases of, 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 oh, or where contraband um, will be seized. That's what they're trying to like predict, whether or not people are going to find contraband on this person. Um, they can go down to the top 10% and still retain over the like over 50% of all of all instances of the of the hit rates, of all instances of seized contraband, which is either drugs or like firearms. Saying that they, they can go to like a, down to like like 10% of the stops and still have still yeah. predict, using their classifier predict that they'll they'll. Weapons will be discovered. Yeah, and they recall like yeah, fifty-two percent, or like fifty-five percent. Um, yeah, and the the types of features that were being given very large weights by the classifier were things like were things like probable cause, seeing actually a, a suspicious object on a person was a good indicator, rather than someone's race, rather than like the location. Um, but the really really cool part is when they reduce that number dramatically. They reduce those the number of uh, of stops for their classifier. Um, was selecting these disparities. This is this is white. This is um, black. This is Hispanic. Just were just com almost completely reduced and normalized to population levels. So by selecting this sort of fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer of the uh, of the stop and frisk, the original stop and frisk, it began to like the disproportionality began to normalize, which is really really cool. Okay. I don't understand. Say, say, explain this to me better. So. This is the percent yeah. of the of the stops of white individuals uh, in New York. This is Hispanic individuals, and this is black individuals. When they went down, for, for, all, for all stops, they take the classifier and change. The if classifier. you go down to the top three percent or top ten percent, yeah, we, we see things start to normalize, start to normalize, start to normalize, and then when you're down to like the one percent, they become more like resembling of the population. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of evidence that there is some sort of discrimination going on argue the other way a little bit in the sense that on the left figure you were saying a lot 50% of the weapons are caught when you look at the 10% and on their 10% line right yeah the, the racial composition of Hispanic and blacks are nearly double of whites when you get to that when you get down you hear 10% at 10%, 10%. 10%. Yeah. so yeah so you you can make a I'm kind of playing there was yeah. here, but yeah. you can make an argument that when you remove those cases where you have very strong evidence, like a partial showing of a gun, yeah. then you get the more uncertain cases. The data shows that there is a racial potential racial Factor. indicator. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, and, and this stuff is always like a double-edged sword. We're looking at it because oh. One one limitation of the data set yeah. is that it doesn't include any information about people who weren't stopped. Right. So the, so you're yeah. it's really hard to infer what would have happened if you had stopped, you know, the, the the white guy in the nice neighborhood who the police didn't stop, right? Maybe they yeah. had done the guy walking yeah by MIT with like cocaine, cocaine is backpack, yeah. right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of nuance to this stuff race and police stops. Um, but more and more data work is being done, and there's a general consensus. So, so did, did this paper, the authors make any conclusions, or they just gave the graphs? Did they say, did they, did they interpret the data for us somehow? So they propose a drastic reducing of the, of the uh, or increasing of the selectiveness of a stop and frisk. Um, Get back to what they would consider to, 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 Yeah, to normalize um, discrimination. Yeah. So. There's this other part that I mentioned early on, and that's low-level arrests. So sometimes these stop and frisks can lead to 
low-level arrests. For example, drug violations, trespass of real property, disorderly conduct, oftentimes like licensing violations, loitering violations. Um, these can emerge from stop and frisks, and they can also be the result of general broken windows policing. When you're like really pursuing these low-level offenses, trying to arrest people, you see increased counts across, across these offenses. Um, so in our arrest data, these are vaguely legal examples. This is the data we're working with. This is generally uh, standard. Um, there are three types of arrest. Um, and they shouldn't really be called arrests. They should be called possible arrests or possible charges um, because there's, they also include summoning and cite, inciting as well. So of all the entries we have, we have on-view arrests, and that's where an officer witnesses a crime being committed. Um, and makes an arrest. There's a take into custody arrest where officer like will find someone who there's a warrant for and take them into custody. That's also an arrest. And then summoning and citing is another type of entry that we have. So the one where they stopped and frisked and found co cocaine on the person is that the taken into custody kind or the on view? Well, that's on view, I guess. That's the, so if they if they um, yeah it'd be an on view. Yeah. They found. They found yeah. Um, so I mentioned also earlier, that immigrants' rights um, are important here and thinking about immigration and undocumented immigration. And the reason is because when there's an arrest, people are fingerprinted. When someone is in into this data set, someone's arrested, they're in a federal database. Uh, have you, any of you heard the term sanctuary cities? Right, yeah. So sanctuary cities are cities that have sort of taken a stance against the federal government, protecting um, people who are undocumented, saying we're not going to invest in, in deporting these individuals. A problem with that, though, is this arrest data. As I mentioned before, this is a federal database. And um, ICE agents, this is that's the immigration authority, have access to this database. And they can see where people who are illegal are arrested. Um, there's a database, or a database. Um, there's an ICE agent. And then they can deport these individuals from the places where they've been, they're currently being held. Um, so it sort of undermines the whole notion of, it undermines the entire notion of a sanctuary city if this is being conducted. Uh, for example, you know, Boston is considered a sanctuary city. They've decided that we're, we are a sanctuary city. However, their stop and frisks and their like, um, low level arrests undermine that. So in order to do any of this work, you have to get the data. Um, and I want to talk kind of quickly about how the ACLU would do that or how you would do that. Um, what the ACL does, ACLU does is they do a public records request. Um, to get the arrest data, we would go to like, the state government. And, there's the, uh, and oftentimes there would be a fee associated with that. So you have to actually pay a fee to have these records released because they have to go through and redact whatever they deem to be um, uh, inadmissible or uh, not, not necessarily, the public should not necessarily be privy to. Um, then the state government, they go to their national incident-based reporting system. Um, they get all the data from all of the uh, contributing agencies from the, the, from the state, and then they, they, they release it. What's very, very frustrating, though, is that, um, for example, in Massachusetts, less than, or barely over half of the agencies are actually using the system. They have to, they, by, by law, they're ordered to, like, to, to, to document their, their arrests, but a lot of them aren't part of the shared database. And so when you do this public records request to the state government, you're not getting everything. Um, so yeah, so one half of the full-time police agencies in the Commonwealth submit their crime data. This is for Massachusetts. Um, so that's very frustrating. And if you're the ACLU, what that means is you have to go to each municipal government, each sub-district, and request their data. And there's often an associated fee. And they can always sort of refuse your, um, your request. They'll have their internal system, which oftentimes won't necessarily entirely overlap with the conventions used by the, um, by the state data sets, um, by the reporting database, and then they, rec they edit those and release them to the public. Um, so it's quite an ordeal to actually get this data. Um, and the ECU has been making all these requests throughout like the past, oh, yeah? Is this different from the federal database you mentioned that the ICE agents have access to? Um, Yes. I don't, no, no, they, they do have access. Yeah, the, the, the federal government, I believe, does have access to this database, but this doesn't contain information on like documentation. I can show you what the data looks like. Did you request data from the federal database? Um, I don't exactly know the sort of red tape in doing that. Um, that might be, yeah, that might be like a FOIA request, and I don't necessarily know. Um, 
I, I maybe the only municipal government has this has access to this database. Yeah. Um, do you you said that only half the people are using that system? Yet they're still documenting. Do you know if they're out of code or they're not following code? That they're they, 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 they can be penalized for not doing that, or is it just like? It, they're still doing yeah. what they have to do, it's just not a shared system. Well, yeah, they could be penalized for doing it, and no one's going to find out until someone does a public records request on them. I, I think that we're, um, a little bit about the sharing of data with government agencies. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is that when President Obama, during his last months in office, he actually signed an order allowing the, the easy sharing of data among like 18, 18 federal agencies. So hmm. before what happened is if, is if you were picked up by ICE, or if you were actually, if, if Homeland Security requested a bunch of data about you, they got your phone records, they got, you know, whatever they wanted to get, they couldn't share that without, um, the, without another agency proving that they have a, like, a reasonable, like, a, a reason for wanting that. But before he left office, he had decided in the interest of national security that he was going to allow the broad sharing. And what that's done is it's created a lot. I was at a privacy conference last year, and the problem is, is that each of the different agencies have different roles and different processes for how they are getting that data and how they're protecting the data. Hmm. And I think the data protection is a really critical yeah. really critical issue that most of us don't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not at all, and I, I'm even more distrustful of, like the smaller government, you know, more you drill down, the more issues I think are raised around data protection, data access, because we have an issue in government as well, and that people, a lot of, like, we don't have the highly qualified folks with the knowledge and expertise who are running these programs and who are experts in handling data. Yeah. So if you get down to, like, a small county government someplace, they're just not going to be staffed oftentimes adequately to figure out what the policy should be and how they should be enforced and how, they're, how they should fairly and adequately be sharing this data. So yeah. So one, one comment, so this is Delight, and she was spent quite a few years in the trustworthy computing area. On the privacy side, the question would be, you know, when, you know, and it's in the public interest to have groups like the ACLU have access to public data sets to actually understand them, the data better. So there's interesting tension there between mm -hmm. policies that might protect individuals and, and our, our maybe interest as a, as a society knowing what's going on. Yeah, and actually, Eric, and to your point, conference that I had attended, they had a, a panel where the ACLU was on one side and all of these department heads that were supposed to be privacy protecting, mm -hmm. you know, employees it, were on the other side. And what the ACLU was saying is they were saying, not only do you want you to make sure that the right agencies can get access, but we want to make sure that you're not just turning over the keys to the kingdom to anybody you feel like. I see. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a double-edged... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's the general stance of like the ACLU that this stuff just needs to be like done, but it needs to be very, very, very transparent. Um, cool. Um, so when I was at the ACLU, um, and I'm still working on, on this data and aggregation, um, dealing with two primarily two different data sets. These are stop and frisk data. This is stop and frisk data from Boston, and arrest data from Massachusetts. Um, what was kind of aggravating is that the Boston arrest data is not actually currently included in the uh, Massachusetts arrest data, even though it's, it's probably a very, very significant chunk of it, because Boston has their own sort of private um, data records. Uh, but we actually just got it. We just got the, we, the public re um, request went through, and we just got the data. Unfortunately, it's in PDF format, so I have to deal with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm currently debugging one of them right now. Um, uh, but yeah, so that we so we just got that data. Um, what's really interesting is Boston is collecting a lot of arrest data. A lot of agencies aren't, and it's a private system. Um, in their um, response to the request, they like noted that this data references their immigration data that they have and all these other sort of data sheets that are related so that they haven't given to us yet. So there's a lot under the um, under the hood. There's like an iceberg of data in Boston. Um, so the arrest results in Massachusetts. Um, so this is what we got. Uh, this is this massive spreadsheet we got um, that included a lot of low-level offenses. We got disorderly conduct. We got trespassing of real property. We got drug and narcotics violations, um, loitering. Uh, and we just got license from, from Boston. Um, but what we have is we have the dates, the county, the agency, 
um, an arrest sequence, which just refers to groups of people being arrested, um, the count. And then we just have the age, uh, sex, race, and then non, not Hispanic or Latino, which apparently is all you need to determine someone's ethnicity. Um, this is the data we have. And what's kind of frustrating about this data, there's a lot, well, a lot of things that are frustrating about this data. Um, there's no data on arrest outcomes. There's separate data for the, um, for the incarceration, for the court system, but there's no data on who of these people is actually, you know, actually being sentenced, which is really, really important if you want to like look at prejudice because, or institutional prejudice, because that's where you would look for it. See, you can't really establish causality without that. Um, also, um, frustratingly, this is like post, this is very post hoc. This is done by the, the arresting officer who is looking at someone, maybe asking them, oh, like, what's your race, you know, or what are you? And if he doesn't know, he'll put unknown, and he'll make some call if someone looks Hispanic or if they don't look Hispanic, um, which might be a, like a goldmine for prejudice in and of itself. Um, yeah, so, but in South, oh, yeah, there's racial data, um, which is kind of a little flawed, and also establishing causality is difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we found a couple things. Um, what the ACLU is interested in, um, even if it's not able to show causality, to show that these people, you know, aren't committing crimes, but are still being targeted, is they want to show that no matter what, by investing in these low-level offenses, especially in these, you know, different areas, these municipal governments are just targeting minorities. Minorities, marginalized groups are already being disproportionately affected by this sort of, by these offenses, even if, even if it's warranted, if these individuals are committing the crimes. Um, interestingly, at the state level, and this kind of breaks down into the various counties as well, um, if you're Hispanic or African American, you're two times overrepresented um, um, of, of your demographic. So African Americans make up, uh, I believe, 10% of the Massachusetts population, 20% of the, of the arrest for these low-level offenses. Hispanics is something similar. Um, another interesting, um, an interesting factoid is that I, I briefly mentioned there's the three types of arrest. There's, um, there's, an, you know, there's a on view and taken to custody, which are kind of conventionally arrests, and there are summons and citations. And when you look at the data, um, Hispanics and African Americans, mostly Hispanics, are way more like when, when they appear in the data, they're way more likely to appear as an arrest than a citation than, than a white than a white individual. It's 84, 84% to 96%. Um, and that's with uh, like 60,000 data points. Um, again, there's issues with causality here because you know Hispanics might be in poor areas where you have more you know violent instances of these of these sorts of crimes, um, but it's just going to show that these that these lower level offenses end up affecting these marginalized groups more. Um, yeah. This picture you showed earlier. I mean, um, is there a there's, there's no column on the location where this occurred, right? So very, very frustratingly, no. We have that for the stop and frisk data. Um, but here, we only have the agency. Um, but Boston, thankfully, um, and I'm really excited to work with this, in their terrible PDF that they gave us, has very vague addresses, so like the street or the intersection. Um, so we, that, that is you know, way more specific. But we have no addresses here. Of the being, um, when you look at the overrepresented based on the demographic, it would be interesting to sort of zero in on the smaller localities to so, see if that still holds out or if it's if they're policing in particular areas more. Yeah, um, yeah, so currently we only have the sub district um, uh, subject information. And I, I went through and I got the US Census data for each. Right? I mean, I automated this, but the, every single sub district, we have like 320, I believe, um, that are reporting. Um, and we can see for every subdistrict, we can compare like the demographics of the subdistrict, which is like, you know, like like this can be large, like Worcester, or they can be like smaller, um, smaller communities. And we can actually see if there's overrepresentation going on. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and again, this is really really significant. This 96% for Hispanics are being arrested because these people are being they're they're, they're being fingerprinted. They're going into the database. Um, oh, also, um, for certain offenses, especially disorderly conduct, um, the individuals, uh, like the Hispanics and African Americans that appeared in the data set were significantly, on average, like much younger than the white individuals. Like it was around four years. 
Um, that was even more pronounced in the stop and frisk data. Which took me a second. Um, I made this little tool. I don't have that much time, um, so I'm not going to go to the site, but I have like, a screenshot of it um, where you can kind of, uh, the ACLU is working on making this. We're working on making this way better. Um, but you can kind of hover over the various, the various subdistricts and see the breakdowns of the populations and click on them and kind of explore how the different arrests break down, kind of scale them by the, uh, scale them by the population. And by doing this, you can see a lot of these places where there is that overrepresentation going on. Um, yeah. So, so this, is, this is a single point, where, a place where we have data. I can pull up the, actually I have a chance here. Um, I'll if I have time, I'll, I'll get back to it. Um, but yeah, and so you can kind of explore here. Um, you can do a, the Hispanic breakdown and actually break down Hispanic, which is technically an ethnicity, into the constituent races. Um, and, and sort of see how this sort of maps out. It's very, it's very interesting stuff to see. Um, OK, stop and frisk results in Boston. Um, so this data set is a little bit less novel. Um, I did a bit of work sort of aggregating these different these different pieces of uh, these different data sets. Um, we had a data set for um, police officers and incidents, and a data set for um, for the actual uh, people who are being stopped and frisked. Uh, did some work on that. Um, some previous work by the ACLU of Massachusetts um, already found indicators of clear disparity. Um, so the Boston's population is 24.4 percent African American, according to the last census, uh, but Black individuals make up 60-70% of the stop and frisks. Um, one thing that we, we, yeah? Do you happen to know what percentage of the police force is African American in Boston? Uh, I, I do not know. I do not know that. I think I remember talking this to, a, to one of the colleagues there uh, about this. And it's not, not, not a very large percentage. It's a fairly homogenous organization. Yeah. Um, so what was really cool about the stop and frisk results in Boston is now we get addresses and we're getting descriptions for what happened, like little blurbs written by the police officer after the fact. Um, and also more information on the suspects, too. We're getting, like, we're getting their, um, you know, what they were wearing, their attire. Um, we, have the, yeah, we have the address. We have the make of their car they were driving. Um, we have a lot more uh, info. We also have the names of the officers doing the stop, uh, which we've done a little bit of work with, but we're hoping to do more work in that space in the future. Um, so yeah, all of these um, new bits of data give us kind of additional, oh yeah? About the ages, do you actually have what those ages are? Yes. Uh, like what were yes. the average ages, do you recall? The average ages for stop and frisk or for arrest or for both? So in general, stop and frisk ended up being, um, being a bit younger. Um, it was like uh, 20s uh, or mid 20s. Um, yeah. In, in that mid 20s. Oh, method, actually, yeah. It, so is that for Hispanics, Hispanics and African Americans? Oh yeah. So they were. Um, so it was, I believe, 33 if you were white, and I think 24 or 25 if you were Hispanic or African American. I forgot to mention this. Yeah. So this, the age differences were super, super pronounced um, in the um, in the stop and frisk data. Uh, the black individuals, the Hispanic individuals were much, much younger. Um, and very interestingly, the, um, I mentioned one type of stop and frisk in observation where there's no engagement, but someone from like, a police officer from afar is noting down a suspicious individual. Um, that right there is where you get an expl explosion of young individuals, like young minority individuals, ending up in the data. And I was talking to um, Carl Williams, this, you know, this prominent civil rights advocate about this, and he was saying, well, to these police officers, what ends up happening is like a group of like, Black kids playing basketball is a kind of suspicious, like maybe like gang activity, but a group of white kids doing the same thing is considered more innocuous. Um, so just going to see that the, 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 the footprint of that sort of so dynamic. The data, they're observing these guys, and then do they go over and then take their names down and other things like that? So that's another pr critical point, too. For observations, the police officers are doing it, are writing down the age, or guessing at the age, I believe. Yeah. But those names have never been entered, so that it's not really on those people's records. No, it's on the records. No, there's, this isn't anonymized. Okay. Yeah. One well, last question about this, too, because this age difference is super interesting. If you were to just uh, sort of partition the data so that you had everybody over 30 or everybody over 33 or something like that, yeah. and then looked at the, um, the, the 
representation of, uh, of race or ethnicity. Do you see um, do you see that gap get larger or smaller? Uh, for, for like, what I'm imagining here is that maybe this looks really really bad for people under thirty, but then people over thirty maybe it gets a little bit. Oh, I didn't look at the distribution. Yeah. Um, so I actually I did like kind of a precision recall curve with age, um, and you can really see um, an explosion very early on, like at a very kind of like at the younger younger age bracket in the black and the Hispanic, um, and then um, white catches up like around like forty ish. It kind of normalizes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can do like a lot of work with the age data here. Right, like I can imagine that, for example, that sixty three percent black, maybe that goes down to forty percent over thirty. Or something like that. Like I just yeah, that. yeah. Um, I wrote a couple of scripts with, like that dealt with that, and that was a long time ago. I can't remember what exactly I found, um, but it, it didn't look too good for the police. Let's just say. Um, okay. Um, so we have now we have additional avenues, different things we can do. Um, I mentioned the well. I mentioned the descriptions. We can do stuff with like actually looking at like treating each description as a bag of words and doing term frequency comparisons. Um, we can look at the officer name and actually see which officers are stopping like black individuals and what the addresses are. Um, and that can be really huge for determining if certain officers are actually like you know following some sort of prejudice policy. Um, Sherrod, Sherrod's paper actually um, references another group that found that in the NYPD, a minority, a select few of the police, could account for like a very, very significant portion of the disproportionality, which would perhaps this can be investigated with this data because we have the um, the officer names. And I did a little bit of this work. I didn't really control for the neighborhood because that was very hard to find demographic information for. I did some stuff with the zip code. And that was really cool. Because we had this, this address, we have zip codes. You can actually like, look and look at the demographics of you know, these like, it's like 40 or so like, zip codes in this area and actually see how the racial demographics sort of pan out. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so here's a description, by the way. So this is like a, one, of the, which one of them, kind of a fairly, a fairly interesting one. Person was observed operating the above-mentioned vehicle. Officer observed this vehicle roll through the stop sign at Creston Street and Blue Hill Avenue, failing to come to a complete stop. Uh, he, informed officers, uh, he informed officers he had a knife in the middle of console. Knowing that XXX was a convicted felon of firearms, officers removed Curry to ensure no other weapons that could harm the officers were present. Um, so there's definitely like a wealth of information here. Um, kind of what happened, and maybe even it's possible to build a classifier. We haven't done this yet. That could actually glean the outcome from this description um, for some for some extended sort of for augmenting the data set. Um, yeah. Did you find that the demographics of the neighborhoods um, was you know, disproportionately Hispanic or black? Yeah. And you have an officer that's regularly patrolling those things. You're going to find a you know a huge prior for them. Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly then what what you'll be able to say about this. Um, I mean, yes, there's a bias, but it's a bias based upon the area and it's the area. Yeah. And everything. So yeah. So um, perhaps I mean again, I, I haven't done the full analysis of this. So if certain police officers are, are covering the same areas, maybe you could do a comparison, an inter-officer comparison, and see if there's certain officers who are like seem like they're actually targeting uh, that they have. That um, in their sort of stop and populations, they overrepresent marginalized groups, and they're operating in the same areas. That would be a possible indicator. Um, but yeah, it's hard. It's really hard stuff to like. It's really hard to discern any sort of causality at all from this data. Um, but you can definitely make observations. Um, so this is the sort of data that we have for each entry. Like a, a description like this, often a little more, um, a little more curt, a little shorter. Um, but this kind of stuff. And you can do some word comparisons. And we've only just started doing this, but you can immediately see when you do this that for like a black individual, um, certain words appear way more. For example, headlight, firearms, Greenwood, which is a neighborhood that has a lot of like black, like it has a large black population, and hoodie. Those are just a select few. Those are very interesting. And for white individuals, prostitution occurred much more often. So that's kind of an interesting fact. Um, so yeah, this kind of um, indicate some sort of validity to this method because it's actually like it's actually finding you know it it, it it seems to be a reasonable way of sort of of it seems it seems like there's some sort of meaning here given that the green greenwood appears there very very upwards for the top. Um, so I did a little bit of work by officer and looked at kind of who was conducting these stop and frisks. So um, each one of these columns is an officer that appears in our data over the course of four years, um, and. This is the number of stop and frisks they were conducting. So an interesting, an interesting fact is that um, so 
48 of, of, of the officers, that's 5%. Um, the top 5% here, um, they've actually conducted 49% of the stops. Um, and among those officers, the, um, the average percentage that, they're, they're tar- the, 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 uh, that are black um, is 78%, while the average for a given officer is 56%, which is a little interesting. So this is probably, um, this gives us some idea that the officers who are doing this sort of thing are probably in the drug crime unit, and there are specific areas they're actually looking at in particular, and they're, they're targeting. Um, <laughs> oh, they have problems, yeah. And this is, like, this is like worse than income inequality in America, so you should take note. Um, about the same. Um, anyway, so another interesting, so because I had the, the, the um, zip code data, I started to um, do a more in-depth comparison than that, 60, that pie chart that said 63.3%. Um, so this is, by, for a given zip code, each dot's a zip code that we have data for from the, from the Boston data. Um, this is, the, these, this is the, the, the black demographic in that, at, at, in that zip code, and this is the percentage black in the stop and frisk data for that zip code. So in an ideal world, um, it would fall along this line, but not exactly. Um, Did you look at who goes to the zip code? Like, I mean, in the which, which police district, officers? for example, you might have one population who lives there, but a very different population who comes into work during the day. Um, like that. Is that available? So I was just looking at the um, the U.S. Census data for the for the uh, for the zip codes, um, but yeah, this can totally be taken somewhere way way further. Looking at like which police officers are stopping individuals from places, what the working population of a zip code is, um, that sort of thing. Um, I looked at also median income as well. I looked at um, poverty rates. I actually found there was a pretty moderate positive correlation with poverty rates across the zip codes. So high, more impoverished areas were um, more impoverished areas had. Higher rate to stop and frisk. Uh, one of the data sets I saw with the, you can map like zip codes to Phipps County, so you can also see the number of like residences, businesses, uh, uh, things like that. So you could look at whether or not it's a more residential neighborhood or more of a, like a commercial agency. Yeah. Place. yeah. And it'd be interesting just to see if. Or the population density. Or, yeah. Yeah, population density. Yeah. Well. There's a lot of, once you cross it with the Phipps County codes, you get also, uh, well, I guess the. Census data you're looking at is probably the FIPS uh, counts. Yeah, so we, there's a lot of census data for zip code. I think zip code is actually the smallest unit that we actually had oh. very strong data for. Um, I'm an expert in, uh, in zip codes over the fake, sort of from the <laughs> fake news work. Well, it's like, uh, you know, FIPS codes and, and zip codes are Block the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so another really interesting fact is all these stop and frisk are very, very low latency. They're, they have very, very small hit rates. Um, so across that whole big pie chart that we saw, um, only 2.5 of those resulted in seizure of contraband. And this is from an ACLU pamphlet that was released before I came, and no one knows where this came from, this 2.5%. We don't have, it doesn't look like we have that data in our stop and frisk data. Um, we haven't been able to find it. Um, this is, might have been released by, um, by the police agency. Are made up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, hopefully, it's not this one, <laughs> or maybe hopefully it is this one. I mean, much. I prefer it if it were much, much, much higher. I guess. Um, so yeah. So there are current ongoing projects at the ACLU looking at um, studying all the effects of certain variables in concert. You know, um, and oh, another thing we're working on is looking at building a timeline. Um, the uh, in previous work with the NYPD data, they found that during certain, like, during the, after like a shooting of a, of a white police officer by like a black individual, the, like, the spike in dispro- there'd be an incredible spike in disproportionality. So looking at like plotting these arrests, plotting these um, stop and frisks against sort of timeline, looking at how dis- different district attorneys might influence, like the, the uh, an, an incumbent might have a different sort of policy than his um, than the person who, who replaces him, um, and that might kind of percolate down to the organization. Um, we're working on, and we're, there's actually a team of, uh, of, of uh, computer scientists in, in Cambridge who have just started to work with the ACLU, working with the kind of the stuff that I started doing to build a really, really compelling visualization out of the arrest data um, that we're, we're going to, to release um, to the world on the ACLU site. Um, and there's also a project that's in its infancy, but a stop and frisk visualizer. Um, I... Um, 
I had a little bit of free time towards the end of of my of, of my time there, and so I started looking at I started looking at the zip codes, looking at where stop and frisks were, and um, I did a cool overlay of the I guess I can pull up if I have a chance, but I did a cool overlay of the various sort of stop and frisks over Boston, and I I, I did that over Google Street View, um, so you can kind of walk through. Uh, you can walk through these the streets of Boston and like oh look like you can you can go to like the like there's like, like um, some sort of um, I don't know like Applebee's there or something you can click on it and it's like drunk guy stumbles into Applebee's and like encounter five minutes and like like no like he, he was like escorted home or something and then there's also like um, individual looks suspicious had hoodie on you can actually go through these various neighborhoods and um, sort of see what goes down and to someone who's very familiar with those areas it, those like results can mean a lot. Um, again, I was with Carl Williams, his advocate, and he had me go through like you know these different neighborhoods, and he wanted to do like a a Google tour, a street view through like you know the places where he like grew up and see oh like the person's being arrested there or the person's being stopped there, being frisked there. Um, what's really really awesome about us just getting this Boston data, their Boston arrest data, and it having um, addresses in it is that we can take those arrest bits of data and overlay them over the stop and frisk data and see and maybe sort of discern some sort of causality or some sort of prejudice there, we're looking at where people are being stopped and frisked and where people are being arrested and see if there's any sort of misalignment. Um, yeah. Device that would help you. Yeah. You put your attributes in and you walk around and it would yeah. alert you when probably exceeded some my, my, <laughs> when, when I told my dad about this, he's like, oh, it should be like Pokemon Go, but for like, but for racism and discrimination. <laughs> Yeah, I think AJ did. Uh, Is it AJ? No, AJ, AJ, Rush. AJ Rush. But it was, it was uh, essentially when you were driving directions, they were telling you if you were going to be going through a bad neighborhood. But then they got a lot of bad press because it was like uh, Microsoft racially, yeah. you know, no, uh, judging. So now we've come back into a that was protective level. Oh, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just a patent. It wasn't a project. Oh, was it, but it did get press, I remember. Yeah, avoid the ghetto feature. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just kind of finishing up here, um, you guys are all very, very talented computer scientists. Cream of the crop at Microsoft Research. Google has nothing on you. Um, and um, what was amazing to me is that at the ACLU, I and this, and this other guy, Nasser, who was like a full-time employee, were the only two like, CS people there. I mean, they had an IT guy, but it was all you know, lawyers diligently like, making you know, spreadsheets that I offered to automate, but whatever. Um, but it was amazing to me that this, 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 this advocacy organization that really, really should really care about this data and these insights hasn't really, is not really fully taking advantage of it. Um, and so they're starting to. Um, we're reaching out to different, um, to different computer scientists in New England, you know, across, across, the, uh, across the world, to kind of help us with these sort of insights um, and help kind of us create tools um, that we can actually share to the, to the public. Um, yeah, and I mean, perhaps if any of you want to develop you know, Google VR, but with, with stop and frisk everywhere, you can walk through Boston. That'd be great, too. Um, but yeah, you know, this is a really, it seems like a really, really rich area. We're just um, we're getting more and more data. These sort of public requests are going through. Um, and a lot of in interesting insights are coming. Yeah. Are you done? I'm close by, so they, I, they're currently sending me stuff to do. So I guess I'm still, I guess I still am. Um, I'm still aggregating data and stuff. But yeah. Questions. The first is, do you know if there's a nationwide effort by the ACLU to be gathering this kind of data across all the different regions and offices? So there's a project based out of the Massachusetts ACLU called Tech for Liberty. Um, they're currently more interested in in doing. Um, in doing privacy work, encryption work, and like helping organizations protect their data. Um, they're just sort of starting to get involved with this. They've done a lot of offloading where they're starting to like, you know, work with other data scientists, but there's no, um, I don't believe there's any like cross chapter initiative to really pursue data science. Okay, my question is, what, do you know what the plans are? Are there any plans? What are, what are they going to do with this data now? That they um, so I, I gave them a bunch of data, um, and they also have a couple like tools, you know, a couple like D3 tools that I've made to sort of um, visualize some of the just the breakdowns of the arrest data, um, and 
they've started they 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 they've already started using it as an internal tool. Um, I was working with um, with Cade, the head of the Tech for Liberty project, and she you know gets her getting her like pamphlets ready. She's like using statistics from this internal tool to sort of support her claims. Um, but yeah, so we've started working with with front end designers and you know web designers to actually really build a very cohesive graphic. Um, that will hopefully sway people towards the ACLU's platform using this sort of data, using the arrest data and um, stop and frisk data as well we're starting to work with. And then what the ACLU, are they planning to like, take that data like, to the to law enforcement or to the media? or Because this is pretty compelling. Really. Yeah, so um, they're, they're planning, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say, actually. Um, but they're, they're currently, there's, there's initiative in the works to really um, to do, to do an advocacy push um, through all the sort of channels to get people mobilized, to get people sort of um, going to their municipal office and saying, hey, we should divest from this, to sort of actually um, bring about effect um, change. So that's sort of in the works. That should be coming late fall. Um, so, yeah. What if you get uh, data on arrests that are, say, independent of, of discrimination, like a, like a burglar alarm going off or a car alarm going off, where the arrest is sort of initiated by something that is pretty objective, right? And then you can see what, what are priors for crime in certain zip codes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, another thing we could do is, you know, try to, like, harness all the Microsoft band data out there and, like, figure out if we can sort of synthesize that in an interesting way. You have people, you have, you have more sensory apparatus in those places by, yes. by demographics. So, you know, yeah, that's true. You might, you might not be independent of, of, of being the viewers to save prejudice. Yeah. You know, but I think... I was thinking more and more along the same lines with John because I think the question is really what is a good evidence or how can we make evidence for racial discrimination on this topic stronger? Yeah. Because you know you have the demographic and then you have the arrest or stop and frisk difference. But because the data for arrest and sentence thing comes from those, if somebody says, But my prior yeah. on my arrest you know, is this, I'm kind of mimicking that, then, like, you, you, we all need a very strong statement towards that. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because if somebody said, but, you know, the crime rates in that population is much higher than right. the, you know, average. Like, if we don't have ground truth, right? So, yeah. If we have the so, ground truth, this, yeah, exactly. how can we approximate that ground truth as accurately as possible is, is a big question. Yeah, no, a huge problem with this. I was talking with a guy um, based in the MIT Media Lab civic, civic group. Um, he was saying, you know, this is, you have to be very, very careful with this stuff. This is like, this is totally a double-edged sword, right? Because I'm looking at this data as a sort of like, you know, leftist college kid, and I see, oh my God, like the police are doing all these terrible things. But if you show this to like, you know, David Duke, he'd be like, of course, right? These are people committing these crimes. Um, and yeah, the causality is like showing this sort of prejudice, showing this causality is very, very important. And I think the way you do that is one consensus and doing this sort of fine grain analysis, like classifiers and looking at, you know, looking at, there's like, there's no one way of doing it. Um, but like, you know, looking at sort of police officers overlapping in certain areas and some police officers targeting and some others targeting um, other groups. Um, there really is like no definitive answer. Yeah. Let me ask Steve Sweetman, who's with us, and you probably don't, probably have met people have met Steve, but I'm working with him on the Ether Committee, and Steve um, uh, is someone charged with thinking about when Microsoft builds like a, a actually a New York City Police Department surveillance system, helping the NYPD out, and we've done this. Uh, what does it mean to do prediction with data sets? And, and anyway, I know Microsoft as a whole right now we're grappling with these questions about when is it okay? When are we discriminating? And I guess to use the word pre-crime. Can you say a couple of comments about that, Stephen? Yeah, no, as, as I was watching this, it was fascinating because the fact that the police forces are tracking more and more data actually helps the case against them in mm. many ways if you look at it from, from their perspective. And, and so there's the whole privacy concerns and should they be massing more of this data if, if they were trying to protect themselves. At the same time, as we, as we think about the data, too, there's almost a reinforcement pattern, right? Which means that the more stop and frisk you get, the more, more data that points out that these types of populations are at risk and of, of, predicting a crime, and therefore the police officer gets told, hey, go to that area and patrol mm -hmm. more, because more crimes are going to be committed. So they go there more often, and look, lo and behold, they find more information, which reinforces their bias. Um, and so there is absolutely this kind of vicious feedback loop that happens. And one of the questions we're, we're wrestling with is, how do you counter that? Right? You absolutely want the data, because the data helps identify the bias. 
the data itself can fuel behaviors, which adds more data, yeah. which reinforces the bias. And you know, it, do we get to a situation where actually a, an officer is, is told, you know what, maybe you're biased. Can the data actually give them active feedback to change their behavior? Yeah. It can actually be used as a tool for them to actually look at it and go, before you, before you stop this guy, consider, yeah. the last 10 guys you stopped look just like him, <laughs> right? You know, uh, are you actually taking a biased perspective? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can the data actually start changing their behaviors? And, and then, then Emre um, does propensity scores and he, he seeks causal signals in data sets. And I was wondering if you had a causal reaction to it, how you study some of these. It's so messy. We actually, when the near uh, uh, stop and first data came out, um, I forget who I was talking to, but we brainstormed for, for a few hours about what we could do on it, like looking through the data descriptions. And um, we were stymied. We didn't want to do a correlational analysis because we figured that lots of people would run for that and we'd lose the race. Um, but um, uh, when we dug, the deeper we dug into it, the messier and harder the problem got, even to the level of, of realizing that policies around stop and frisk were set, even though they were you know, promulgated from above with, with the New York City Police Commissioner, um, there was, there was um, um, discretion at the precinct level to, to, to behave one way or the other. So, so even when we said we could normalize um, by like population demographics at the precinct level, uh, that was that even that wasn't going to be enough without getting more insight into how the, the individual uh, precincts decided to you know uh, set their policies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, it was so, really complicated, and we just kind of yeah. So so just putting back, you know, I, I guess I'd be interested in your views, Zachary, is you know whether or not intelligent systems mm -hmm. who had access to this data would they help or hurt the problem? Is uh, fundamentally what we're wrestling right. with. Yeah. Right. Um, one place this has really come up recently, right, is with, with privately licensed software that's for judge, that judges use to determine recidivism rates. So recidivism is, you know, given someone commits a crime, what are the, what, what are the chances of repeating? Um, and there's a recent sort of, um, this stuff is licensed, this, the software is licensed, um, and it's not very transparent, of course. Um, and there was a recent case where um, there were two individuals who committed the crime together, and one was like black and one was white, and they had two different, you know, the classifier spit out um, spit out two different um, probabilities for them to um, to bounce back, and the one for the white individual was way, way, way lower than the black individual. And um, this was the news because, of course, like the, you know, the white individual had reoffended, and the black individual hadn't reoffended um, since since the uh, since the crime. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really um, it's a very very tricky question. Maybe one of the ways that you know. It, rather than rather than issues of the singularity and Terminator and all this stuff, the place where AI is really really scary is in that sort of thing, where you have where AI becomes this institution that just perpetuates biases. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess the question is who's using the tool and how aware they are of all the nuance. I have a last last comment. Uh, Emily, you have a comment or question? I mean, so I, I'd be curious what whether the ACU was talking about this, but from the computer science perspective or the, the statistics perspective, you need some randomization yeah. in things like the recidivism uh, example. You know, you you would keep someone in from parole and let someone else out on parole, right? And see, uh, you know, how how uh, outcomes differ right under a random experiment. Ooh. But under the you know principles of you know justice, <laughs> you can't randomize your treatment of individuals. You have mm -hmm. to have some principled way where you know it's fair to both. Both people, yeah, um, and and so that really limits exploration of things like you know, yeah. you know maybe the police officer says I think I want to get this one of the systems says, oh, for the point, right? Mm -hmm. right. You can't actually you run an exploratory, exploratory, like, we'll exploratory get causality. Uh, but standards. Standards. Can you imagine, can you imagine at, at an arrest, uh, or at, at a stop yeah. and frisk, you know, and at an arrest, you get basically flip a coin to the part of part of the, oh, you're part of the Boston clinical trial. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats, you get to go to prison. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so so uh, let, let's uh, take off the discussions offline. But thanks very much.